OK. Good afternoon. It felt like saying good morning, but it's actually truly afternoon. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, I'm aware that we are up against some very, very um, exciting and uh, popular mentoring sessions and uh, music industry panels. Nevertheless, uh, the topic in this room is uh, of utmost importance <laughs> uh, to me personally as an activist and uh, to uh, Estonia and to the music industry. And uh, hopefully we can get a very uh, clear and good overview of what the state of play is, what has been done, what can be done, and to come up with some very uh, specific proposals uh, how to improve this situation. So uh, very happy to welcome here uh, the panelists, Lina Kanter, first of all. Lina is going to give us a presentation about the situation of the gender pay gap in Estonia, the highest pay gap in the EU since uh, many years. So we in Estonia are always very happy to be the Muster Schuler in every uh, possible area. This is certainly one area where we hold place number one, which is uh, not a favorable position. Lina works uh, at the Ministry of Social Affairs with e uh, equality. Then we have uh, another keynote from uh, Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa is the founder and leader of uh, Key Change, which is a EU-wide uh, project to uh, promote women in the music industry, and music industry being another example of, an, of a serious uh, issue in terms of gender equality. We have Paulina Hokas, uh, the power lady from Finland, who doesn't probably need an introduction for the TMW audience. Everyone knows Paulina <laughs> well enough. But uh, uh, my hope is for Paulina to come in with some um, serious uh, examples of best practices, because Finland, of course, is a shining beacon in that uh, area. And then we have um, our token male participant. <laughs> How does that feel, Kalle? <laughs> because usually it's the other way around. Uh, Kalle is a member of uh, Estonian parliament, the outgoing parliament uh, uh, from the Reform Party, uh, currently in opposition, but has been in the uh, forming the government and leading the Estonian government for many years. And, uh, um, a liberal party that um, generally, I think, uh, talks about um, gender equality, but uh, then again is held hostage by big business who are not very keen to implement more and more regulations. So uh, hopefully this panel will come up with, uh, with uh, smart recommendations how to reach uh, beyond the situation we have right now. So um, uh, we start with uh, a keynote by uh, Lina to uh, set the stage to uh, establish what's, what, what we're talking about, why we need to talk about it, why, it, why this issue is uh, uh, important, even uh, in a music conference. Thank you, Maris. I prefer to talk when I'm standing, then I have a better overview. And thank you all for coming. I'm really happy to be also invited. And uh, I'm also grateful for this opportunity to speak to you. Yes, um, I have a presentation. And I would like to give a brief overview about the gender pay gap as a topic. And um, I named it, Does Gender Matter? if we talk about earnings and if we talk about economical independence. We'll see. Uh, normally, I don't know this auditorium, but normally it's good to start from the same level and page. And that's why I thought that maybe I would just uh, 
easily explain the main uh, terms and explanations what we are talking about. First of all, pay discrimination. It sounds very easy to um, figure out. It's, for example, it, it, there is a two salespersons and they have the same education, the same work experience, they both are good workers, recently hired, and they get different salaries then it's obvious it's not right. But things get complicated if we talk about equal pay for equal work. It's not only the same, exactly the same work. It could be also that they work in totally different positions. I mean, the same position level, but totally different names of the positions. Then it's much complicated to discover, is there equal work? Is there equal pay for equal work? And that's why I would like to say that equal pay for equal work means that we have to evaluate different works, we have to give them some kind of value, and then we can compare different kind of works and uh, figure out is it um, equal pay that we are paying for. Things get even more uh, difficult and complicated when we talk about gender pay gap. Then we don't talk anymore about the concrete positions only, and we don't compare those and those pays. But then we already talk about the structural differences. For example, we know that men and women are working often on the different positions. Men are in the higher positions, women are on the lower positions. We know that this causes also pay gap. But what we don't do often is that we don't think that this is wrong. We don't watch into this problem as a problem of equality issue. That why mainly men are on the top, mainly women on lower position. That's why the gender pay gap is much more wider issue, but there are still problems we need to tackle. We just can't accept that we know why the differences is, and we accept it. So the gender pay gap collects all the average earnings, our earnings on men, all the men, and all the average earnings on women, and then it compares. And what we see is that men in general together earn more than women in general. So equal pay day, what is that? And equal pay day means that it's a symbolic day. If we see that men are earning their year salary, then women catch up with their earnings. Three, two, four months later, it depends on the country. And this year, Estonian women catch up on 2nd of April to get the same amount of money as men does. That's about um, definitions. But why we celebrate it, why we are talking about the equal pay day or pay gap? It's three main issues. First, it's the matter of human rights. And women's rights are human rights. Secondly, we know that if we don't pay attention on those differences, then we lose a lot of money in other sectors. For example, it means that women are living, living in poverty. It means that children also living more in poverty if we don't pay attention on women's salaries. And other social issues that are, for example, also violence against women is um, involved with that. And thirdly, that's not something that I figured out. It's already years and years talk that if we pay attention on equal salaries and on economical um, equality between men and women, then 
we gain a lot of economical benefit out of it. Estonia, as mentioned, is first in line and not in the good way. And I have some slides that shows why Estonia is so special. Overall, um, the pay gap in Estonia is uh, 26.6. But if I look at musicians, singers, and composers, then the good news is that uh, there the pay gap is 11.8%. But it includes only employees, not the people who are having private licensed companies or who can take out dividends. And uh, if you would like to compare the musicians, for example, with actors, then you can see also that the pay level is, uh, for musicians, a bit, a bit higher. If we look at the trend, then we see that we are on the right track. Pay gap is actually reducing, but not fast enough. If we want to have equality between men and women in earnings, then with this speed, it would take until 2045. And everybody knows that in Europe, generally, women are more educated. And there should be correlation between education and your salary, but it's not. And if, it look at the, if we look at Estonia, then actually Estonian people are quite well educated. The problem is between the gap men, on men and women, and it's on their early education. And it means that we should pay more attention on males' education also. Sorry, can I ask, how do you read the statistics? What's the yellow and what's the blue? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, the orange is female and the blue is male. Yeah? Okay. Sorry, uh, there's something missing. Yeah, no Thank you for the clarification. Also, employment rate. I'm happy to announce that Estonian employment rate for men and women are high. But the problem comes when uh, men and women get children. Then the females, especially with the small children, then the females' uh, employment rate goes smaller. And uh, the care burden also is mainly the women's issue. If we talk about the horizontal segregation, it means that men and women are in the labor market, but in Estonia, as we see, we are first in line again. We like to work separately. Men are, are in one sector, and women are in another sector. It looks like we don't want to be very much combined and work together. And this could be an issue, because it means that men are mainly on the sectors which are well paid, and women are in the sectors, sectors that are not so well paid, but uh, what are important sectors also. And then there is sec vertical segregation. Again, Estonia is very high on that, and it means, what I mentioned earlier, that men are highly, uh, mainly on higher positions, women on lower positions, and not only that, we see in Europe, there is one leader from three in the EU for manager level, for example. Estonia is not so bad on that. But if we look at, even if you are in the same level, professionals, manager, technicians, then the salaries are still different for men and women. And the higher position you get, the bigger the gap between men and females are. So if you don't want to have different pay, then you should work on the <laughs> with men, then you should work on the lower position. And lastly, there are stereotypes. If you look at Estonia, then we see that Estonians, at least 70%, find that women's most important role is to take care of home and family, 
And for men, it means that more than half of the population find that men should be the main caregivers of the family. These, I'm sorry to interrupt, but these two slides were really shocking because where are these 20% men? I mean, you have 70% of people who think women need to take care of the family and only 50% thinking men, men's main purpose is to earn money. So what do these 20% men do? They don't earn money and they don't take care of the family as a first yes. preference. Thank you for that. And that is one survey that also showed that most unhappy are men who are living alone because they have this double burden, taking care of their maybe relatives and also earning the salary. And nobody is helping them on doing all those both things. And uh, I know that my time is starting to run out. To conclude, what to tackle on uh, example of Estonia is mainly to reduce segregation, both in labor market and also in educational choices. It means that we need to look deeper in our educational system, how kindergartens, how schools itself already direct young girls and boys to certain choices and is it really a free choice that our young people are doing and also if they are on the labor market then is it always that it depends on you and you solely because if that look at the statistics then seems like if you are a girl you can get through you can get high you can get good salary but probably with a bigger effort than your brother, for example. And also more share, uh, equal sharing of care burden. It doesn't mean only children. It also means that we are older, er, we have el elderly people we have to take care of and also disabled people. Also non-discriminatory organizational practices. It means that we can't, through, we can't get through without employers' help. They have to look at their practices over and make them better. And lastly, as I mentioned, stereotypes that are not of the, uh, always uh, good ones. They could be negative and we should get more aware of those stereotypes, all of us. And here is just one example, I hope. I have time to show and share it with you, but I'm not sure how to make it start. Yes, it's from YouTube. If you can get to YouTube, if you remember the title. Oh, start. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, Kom, kom, kom. Ga je dat zo Kom, 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 kom. Ga je dat zo lekker. Ga je dat zo lekker. Ja. Hoe doen jullie? Hoe doen jullie? Premia. Thomas, see four. Ei saa. Thomas ütles, et saab. See on rahul. <laughs> <laughs>
Me tegime võrdselt tööd. Ma tei teinud. Toomas ütleb, et tegime. Kolm pool. Miks Toomas neli saab? Ma tõen vaja. Rohkem kui mul. Vaatu, kus suhul ta on. Vaatu, kus suhul peredal on. Jumal, vaatu, kus suhul, et ta peres kõik on. Mees peab ise kõik kinni maksma. Noh, sa teed väga palju asju ise. Söögid, riid, et sul on suur kokku hoid. Me tegime võrdselt tööd. Ta ongi trennis. Ja ma tahan ka käia. Mis asja? Sa jooksed ju kogu aeg ise räägid. Lasta jääda tagasi, poodi tagasi. See ei ole see. Naised söövad palju vähem. Mule, sõdu ei võidata, kui mehed ainult pudingit ja kissi söövad. Me tegime võrdselt tööd. Ööklubid on teile tasutada. Võta. Võta, võta. Me pidid naistele lõigast alt mõjuma. Võrdne töö, võrdne tasu. Leila, olegi naa, tule korraks palun siia. Ole hea. Sa oled meil siin juba ju kuuekümnetatest. Ütli, kas sa oled kunagi saanud sama palju valka kui mehed? Sama palju. Sama palju kui mehed. Sama palju. Nii need asjad lihtsalt on. Nii et... Jah. Noh! Tõe või! Tule! Yes, uh, that was one example. One example that is from the real life, and uh, what is easy to recognize. But as I mentioned, pay gap overall isn't so easy. But I would be happy if we could start at least from changing our stereotypes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lena. And um, Vanessa takes over from here. It just uh, uh, sort of a little bridge uh, um, about uh, this uh, older lady in the video reminded me of that. There's um, a well-established Estonian music organization led by um, a woman who, uh, from this generation, who uh, actually. Um, was proud about in employing many women because uh, she doesn't need to pay them so high. <laughs> so it's not just men discriminating against women. It's uh, we, th that's not where the battle line runs. But that's uh, a very very concrete example from Estonia and the music industry we are talking about here. But now Vanessa, tell us about what to do. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to stand up as well. Um, and I suppose, yeah, my role here is to try and give us all some inspiration around how we can work together and actually come up with some solutions and how we can look at all of these problems and actually identify them as opportunities to make the industry stronger, to make the world um, a better place, I suppose. And just responding to your presentation, thank you so much for all of that information. I can see that the UK is not doing very well either. Um, I mean, a few things I'll just quickly throw in um, as background, and maybe this can be useful for the discussion later, particularly because we have a, 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 a politician on our panel. Um, in the UK, we do have compulsory gender pay gap reporting. It's a law now. 
and it's really important. It's beginning to change things. So I would really urge every European country to do that, um, particularly in the music industry. Um, the gender pay gap has been exposed at being as high as 47% amongst some of the major music companies. And suddenly, in the past two years, we've seen many more women being promoted to more senior positions in those companies. So it's definitely having an impact. It shouldn't have been necessary to wait for a law like that, but that's what's triggered it. And I think government has got a really, really important role to play in demonstrating that it understands what the next generation expects and that it can see that now is a time when we really need to all work together towards change. And I think it's really important, as you were kind of pointing out, it's not always women who are pro-gender equality. So that's why with our key change program, we've been really keen to ensure that it's uh, a movement that's led by men and women who all want the same uh, change. So the story behind this is really an example of individuals beginning to notice what's wrong about the world in which they're working and having conversations and then generally building up a, a kind of solution to um, raising awareness and actually taking us to the next stage of the debate. So as long ago as 2014, I started talking to mainly male festival directors, um, and we were all just talking about the fact there aren't enough women on festival stages. Generally at conferences like this, there aren't enough women in, in the group of attenders or on conference panels, and we just couldn't understand why that was still the case. And then, uh, fortunately, we also managed to bring in a well-known female festival director, Helen, who's standing at the back from Talent Music Week. She was the first in our group of partners um, who is a woman, so I was really pleased that Talent Music Week were able to join in as well. And what we did is really learn from the UK example where PRS Foundation, my organisation, have been running a targeted fund for female songwriters and composers, and we took it to the European level. And what I'm going to show you now is a really quick kind of um, whiz through what key change is. But most importantly, I want to show you that the statistics in the music industry are as bad as some of these statistics we saw earlier, because I think the industry is a microcosm of society, and it perhaps is even worse in some cases when it comes to aspects like sexual harassment, because it's generally not a very regulated industry. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some tips that I think are useful from the key change movement that could be applied to campaigns here in Estonia around gender equality or at European level. And on your chairs, or if you're sitting at the back, we've got some uh, copies at the front. Um, we have been distributing a manifesto, which was really uh, put together thanks to the key change participants. We have one key change industry professional here. Um, good to see you. Um, and uh, I'll be talking about that in a moment. But this manifesto is putting forward recommendations for national government, European Parliament, the industry itself, um, because we think that all of those organizations, all of those structures need to work together if we really want to push things forward. So Key Change very simply began as a talent development program, and it also expanded to include a pledge towards gender balance by 2022, which 150 festivals worldwide have now signed up to. The talent program um, involved 30 artists and 30 innovators or industry professionals. In fact, your photo is right there, I think. Um, and the reason that we wanted to include our, our um, industry professionals as innovators is because I think the other thing that's also really relevant to the gender pay gap debate is that the world around us is changing beyond recognition when it comes to technology, and that's very much the case in music. But if you look at the workforce in the music industry, it's barely changed. Basically, the same men are in the same positions, but they're just a bit older and their hair is a bit more grey. So I think what we're trying to say with this group of 
of innovators is that for the industry to be more successful and to keep up with the rapid developments around us, the workforce needs to develop too. And we need to see more diverse um, people working both on stage and behind the scenes for us to really um, sustain the success that music has had in the past. Um, the festival pledge is something that we didn't plan. So this is maybe uh, an interesting tip for any other campaign around gender equality. What's been very important about Key Change is it's always been flexible, organic, and open. And what began as simply a network of 60 women from six different European countries became something that lots of people got really excited about. And the festival partners, which includes Tallinn Music Week, but also Reaper Barn Festival, Iceland Airways and others, they all just said, well, we need to show that we're serious if we're supporting all of these individual women to advance their careers. We can't just ignore what's happening in our own structures. So, so it's actually the partners who came up with a pledge that suddenly people started inquiring about. And they came to me after discussions like this saying, how can we sign the pledge? And suddenly we realized we had a bit of the beginnings of a movement on our hands. And um, it's really just by being in different parts of the, of the world and talking about what we're all trying to do that's inspired um, so much interest in key change. And it's not about naming and shaming, it's about getting people together, working towards something that's more positive for everyone. So going back to that why question, I won't repeat the point about um, you know, the economic benefits of having a more diverse workforce, including women. I think in music, what I was so proud of is we did a panel discussion in London involved the male controller of BBC Radio 3, which is the classical station in the UK. And he has joined with BBC Proms, which is one of the biggest festivals to sign up. And I just said to him quite simply in front of a room like this, so why did you sign up? And he said, because the music program will simply be of a higher quality if we're selecting from a broader range of composers and musicians. So I think that for me has to be the starting point with music. I never accept the statement, well, oh, it's great to talk about gender, but what about quality? For me, it's the opposite way around. It's the more choice we have, the more talent we welcome into the industry, the better the programming will be. And the other reason why key change is so important brings us to those statistics which show how um, bad things are in the industry and, and in many ways echoing what we've heard about society as a whole. So here we have that the average gender pay gap at major companies in the UK was 30%, but actually, as I mentioned, some of the largest, such as Live Nation and Warner Music, um, some of their statistics revealed a 47% pay gap. Um, we can also see that the number of registered uh, female composers and songwriters across those six European countries averages at about 16% of, of the total number. And I won't read all of those out, but you can see that it's much worse in the recording studio, 2% of recording uh, studio engineers and producers are female. Um, and then when it comes to the senior posts in the workforce, again, it echoes the statistics we heard earlier about Estonia's pay gap, that the senior roles are largely taken by men. And I think this statistic is actually quite generous. I think if you get to the very top of the industry, we're looking more, more like 10% uh, women. The other reason I think we wanted to really uh, launch into key change is that there was an appetite for something to move forward. So this actually happened, as you can see, back in 2015. Hopefully you all, have you all seen these posters? No? Okay, so these were huge in the UK. So uh, the posters where you can hardly see any names is where every male name has been uh, deleted or covered up. So you can see Creamfields, that leaves you with about five artists out of hundreds. Uh, you can see what's happening with Reading and Leeds. So every year with the festival lineups, there was a kind of big outcry on social media. And it's continuing now. Um, and it's become really interesting because each press release about the lineup now is actually about how many women uh, festivals are booking. So Primavera reached a 50-50 balance. They didn't want to sign our pledge because they don't 
don't believe in joining in with things like this, but they did it anyway, so that's fine by me. Um, and Glastonbury are also talking about their pledge, or not about their pledge, but about their gender balance. Again, they are worried about being called out by the press if they sign up to something. Um, but there's definitely this appetite for change. And then there's some stats that were gathered in, in uh, about festivals in the UK, again, showing that only about 26% of the lineup featured any women at all. On to opportunities. Um, what we did back in 2011, before there was any real public debate about the gender gap, is in the UK we launched a fund called Women Make Music. Some people were not that happy about this at the time. They thought it was possibly some form of discrimination because it was women only. But then I had to say, well, of all of the applications we're receiving for funding at the foundation, only 16% featured female artists. So obviously it's not discriminatory. It's a way of balancing um, something that's clearly lopsided with our general um, funding process at the moment. And when I talk about opportunity, the reason and I think this is a great story, is that 77% of the people who applied to us had never applied to us before. They were all, uh, were not. I mean, they weren't all at the right level for the grant, but many of them are incredibly talented and have gone on to do brilliant things further to our funding. And some of them are people you will have heard of, like Let's Eat Grandma and Laura and Vula um, and, and more. So um, I think targeted initiatives really work, and this is a time when we can launch those and start to see progress. Progress. And the results so far, having run Women Make Music and then developed a European initiative on top of that, are that we now have all of those festivals and more who've signed up to the 50-50 um, pledge for 2022. And it's growing uh, week by week. And if we had lots of money and marketed it heavily, I'm sure we would have more. But we want to keep it as a kind of organic movement that's about people who uh, work together and, and want to push for this change. There's been loads of activity across the world, various events. There's been ambassadors. I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, and and um, lots of really stimulating discussions and challenging discussions sometimes, which I think is really important. So for me, what's changed now compared with 2011 is people are talking about the issue and we're hearing people come up with sometimes pretty scandalous questions. Um, one example is in New York, there was a young guy in the audience and generally my experience of the younger generation, whether male or female, is that they're really excited about key change. And this guy put his hand up and uh, just said, um, oh yeah, this is all great, but what's in it for me? <laughs> <laughs> and then the panel was, you know, obviously gender equality is good for all of us, it's generally going to make our gigs and festival experiences better, but it was a bit of a kind of shock when he asked that. And then the other huge advantage, and this is what I would definitely recommend in, in the Estonian context, is that now is the time to really push on building that awareness and, and um, really build the uh, press coverage and media interest. And we've just been kind of inundated with press requests and interviews about key change because finally people are standing up and saying we're going to do this so the value of this press coverage has been sort of beyond recognition of any other project we've run and then we also made sure that we were talking with politicians and policymakers. So this takes us back to that manifesto I told you about. And we presented it in European Parliament in Brussels. And it's looking at a lot of those broader issues around working conditions, transparency in pay, particularly for female artists who are often realizing that their male equivalent in the lineups are getting way more money than they do, but there's no real way of them finding out. So there's lots of interesting issues in there that we're still pursuing. Um, so I'm going to be really quick with my final um, tips on what I feel the critical success factors have been, and hopefully this will start the next bit of our conversation. I think firstly for me, it's about having that bit of evidence, the statistic that really identifies the problem, and you've got that, you've got all of your charts that you showed earlier. We actually started in the UK with our 16% 
figure around the percentage of songwriters, but then we looked at festivals. Um, and then what really helped with Key Change is that Me Too happened uh, in the middle somehow, just as we were about to launch. And it meant that there was just much more general public awareness and much more appetite for people to demonstrate to their friends, to their colleagues, to everyone that they also didn't want to be associated with the kinds of people who were behind uh, you know, the incidents that were flagged by Me Too. So I think that was really um, important. And I think now we're still in that moment. So I would definitely urge any action to begin right now. Um, the next point was um, the fact that we have a really big critical mass of female stakeholders at every level. So we've got ambassadors on the right. This is Nadine Shah. We have an indigenous um, artist from Canada who's been helping us. Shirley Manson from Garbage joined me at South by Southwest on stage and has been incredibly passionate about this. And we, you know, and alongside that, we've also made sure that m all of our panels about key change involve men. So it's that United Nations call it he for she. Um, but we've been in really sure that in the top right corner, we've got Richard James Burgess, who runs the Independent Label Association in the States. Um, Target, who is a DJ at the BBC promoting grime, hip hop and rap. Uh, there we have uh, Siggy from Iceland. So it's about having leading men on board because after all, in pretty much every sector, they are still generally the ones who have the most power collectively so there's no point in women running a kind of specialist initiative on the side I think it needs to be involving all of us um, this is a photo on the right you can see Helen from Tallinn Music Week and Anne um, from Jazz Car Festival um, and what we've been trying to do is make sure that on the one hand with our talent development program we are as they say in politics investing in the talent pipeline and I think that's really, really important. And I know we can always say it's all about education. It's all about those stereotypes that are formed at a young age. But there is no point in making that investment unless you also um, employ what I call positive action, not positive discrimination, so that you're promoting the more senior role models that are already there and have done amazing things. Because if you can't see it, you can't be it. That's what we say in the UK. So you need to be able to see where your career is going. And we need to see women on festival stages right now for the younger women who are coming up behind them. And then nearly to the end, collaboration and competition. So I think this is where Creative Europe, you know, a governmental body, um, has been incredibly important in providing the initial stimulus. So I would urge at national level, it would be great for governments and public funding to get involved right at the beginning. And then with the private sector, we've got lots of collecting societies and sponsors involved here. And what's been really useful is that as one of them joins in, then the next one feels like they need to join in. And so you get this ripple effect. So I think it's about collaboration, creating a network, but also kind of uh, pushing them a little bit to kind of compete with each other and make sure no one gets left out. And then finally, um, this is a message to all of you in case you, I mean, I'm assuming a lot of you are working in the music industry to help us keep promoting this movement. Um, what we're now doing is we're extending the pledge. So we want to keep bringing festivals on board, but we've also been inspired by the fact that some quite well-known labels and broadcasters and people from other bits of the industry have, uh, have also been asking us how they could get involved. So we're staying true to our original idea, which is we remain open and flexible and we're going to grow the movement so that we can include any kind of music organisation. So if you work for an organisation or you know people who do and they want to be involved with Key Change, then you can just get involved with us through the various um, uh, social media, through our um, email, or just come and talk to me afterwards. So those are my tips. Thank you so much, Vanessa. We actually, sadly, just have 15 minutes left, but uh, let's try to uh, be uh, quite concise. And Paulina, uh, what are your remarks there? What's your experience in Finland? Because Finland, in the general EU-wide statistics, looks very good. Do you have a, an insight for us in terms of Finland in general and music industry in Finland? What has been done? What has been 
what has worked well? What works well is never um, resigning at all to the fact that things would be well. Um, when, uh, this was taught to me by President Tarja Halonen, our first female president. Uh, she's still going very strong on this. And it's um, the reason I became a, you know, an activist feminist is because she, she really ranted at me in Shanghai back in 2000. And when would this have been? Pia, you might remember better. 2010, maybe, nine, ah, who cares? Uh, but uh, I, had, um, I had really, she didn't quite use the word, but close to it, I had really fucked up. There was a, Finland was doing the uh, Shanghai World Exhibition as every other country, and we did a three year project that I was in charge of, of like cultural exports to China. And then when there was like the one sort of important day of uh, the Finland day at the World Exhibition, um, she came to me like sort of after the event and I was like all happy about how much work we'd done in China and for, you know, for three years, all of these artists, all of these visual artists, all of these architects getting really, uh, and, and choreographers and dancers getting such beautiful work around China and really we, we got results. And she was like, I, I need to speak to that Paulina Ahokas. And, uh, and I heard about it and I was like, oh, wow, she will probably come and thank me for this great job. And sh I can tell you, she did not. She really ranted at me for, three, uh, for a good hour. Her ad adjutants were trying to like, get her out of there, but she was like, no, this discussion needs to be done. And she really like, taught me for an hour of, you know, she's seen three waves already in her lifetime where you know, this uh, Me Too and Key Change is not the first time in our history, not even in our lifetimes, when things have gone like this, in like globally. There will always be a time when no, when nobody cares, and then all of a sudden, uh, when, when nobody cares, we look at it like this. And then these issues come up, and then they go down again. And she was saying that, you know, well, we might have had time in Finland when we had a female president and a prime minister at the same time, but how long did it last? Not long. And she's right, it didn't last long. And And then, you know, just as a turn of a hand, palm of your hand, things can go different. And they do. So it's uh, the only thing we can do really is to pay attention all the time. So it's, uh, I might be a, for example, a leader, a, a CEO of my company, but it doesn't say that I wouldn't constantly close to like, really doing wrong. Uh, just recently, uh, we had established um, a pay system to Tampere Hall. So it's not just like I, I think of who deserves a great salary and who doesn't. But we established like according to all of the positions that we have, the level of, of, uh, of challenge and the level of, you know, to each job and then the level of how you perform in it. We had all of everybody in our, uh, in our company, we were at that time 88 people. So we had everyone sort of involved in it, like in establishing what the, chan what the like challenge level of their particular job is. And then we established, I think, 17 types. And then together with the workforce, we also established of like, what do we consider and consider a good performance? So we established a system for that as well. Because we didn't want that to be either, you know, the manager's decision. So there is a system, but we still sort of, of course, we look at, you know, who, we, who really is a talent and who we want to keep. And I started interviewing to that system a little bit too much, where my chief of development, she just came and saying like, do you notice that you've just given raises to men, mostly? And, uh, and there was, we started looking at it, and, uh, and she was like telling me that, like, why is this? And then I tried to give a reason to everything, but it's like at the end of the day when she really questioned me, I could not really give a proper answer. So it's like uh, there's a like we I could be ho wholesomely proud of a lot of things that we've done and for example at at Tampere Hall with our people, but still it doesn't mean that I wouldn't I wouldn't have to like really concentrate on it every single day and have somebody smarter than myself to really scrutinize me and question. So it has to be measurable and it has to be in order to even assess the effect, and um, in terms of measuring things, we are lagging far behind in Estonia. Transparency is the first step to take, and that has been extremely difficult 
Kalle, I think you got some inspiration already from Vanessa, so that that's a, would be a fantastic spillover effect, even this one uh, poster. Um, we are preaching to the converted here. I mean, I don't think we need to, con uh, to convince you that uh, uh, gender equality and gender pay equality is a good thing for the whole society. And yet there are so, so uh, big obstacles in this way. So uh, what, what could you do? <laughs> the answer is I, I don't know, but... Um, but um but what Paulina just said that uh, you can uh, nev you can never take anything for granted. So so basically, I mean, being outspoken and, and being outspoken in, in that topic and in other topics, it's uh, it's it's crucial at the moment. Uh, we are facing uh, a really, let's say, um, uh, conservative uh, government that will be formed probably uh, in in a few weeks in Estonia, which is uh, which is, I mean. This was a huge surprise, and and and, and totally the opposite that uh, that the uh, let's say public and voters uh, wanted, and uh, and um, and I think that in in many topics, let's say the society has taken things for granted, and and uh, and that's that's something that uh, that uh, and I'm not saying that all the all society, but but let's say some part of the society. But it, what comes here? So let's say um, I've been. Um, I've been doing it or trying to do it uh, by myself as well, hiring uh, women if it's possible. So, so, but it's always you have to explain. So, so why women? So I said, why not? And uh, and uh, and uh, and and that's it. So, so for, for example, for the Tallinn airport. So, so we just I just said that we we are going to find the best women candidate, not the, the best candidate, but the best women candidate, because we have to show that in uh, state-owned enterprises there can be an uh, opportunity for women CEOs as well. And, and I think that uh, Pirat Murktubo has performed very well, and, but what we see is that there is huge competition for, for, the, for the great uh, and good uh, CEOs um, overall. But, uh, but one positive trend that I, uh, that, I, that I saw from the first presentation is, is that everything is changing. And I mean, the, the meaning and the understanding of work is changing, the education system is, is changing, and this is supporting actually the trend quite well where we have to endorse competence, not, not the gender, but, but the competence itself. And one thing that I've been struggling for quite a long time is the, is the let's say, discrimination of age. I was elected to the parliament when I was 21, so so you can imagine. So so being being uh, around the table with all those guys who have been been there for 20 20 years, so it was quite hard to convince that oh, I have an opinion as well. They can even listen to you, but where they have to use some sort of weapon against you, then it's always the age. So nothing else, but this is the age. But let's say this is let's say. Much, much more than just uh, just uh, gender pay pay cap, but but uh, I mean, you'll just have to bring, let's say, the bright examples on stage. I just bring one one last one, which is uh, which is a hobby circle, um, hobby, hobby, ring, hobby circle, which is uh, which is developed and funded by IT visionary Tavi Kotka in Estonia, who is quite well known. And, uh, and uh, he's focusing just for girls, and uh, the topic is technology. So basically, they have to do many things, I mean, to develop this and that kind of stuff. And uh, he invited just girls, because if you put boys and girls together, then it's always boys are just uh, going over, grabbing everything, and then the girls are trying to, uh, trying to uh, be on, on the second row or something like that. But uh, he just said that all the girls only are welcome, and, and we did it. We followed the, the example as well in our school uh, for the first grade students, and, and but we separated. Let's say we, we did it for boys and girls, but we keep them in, in uh, separate spaces. So and it works very well. So you just have to, uh, let's say, find find the talent in in in, in all the levels, and 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 then it's then it's helping. Just Can I just quickly say something in response to that? I think at the moment, for me, and I agree with you, Paulina, there's, this, there's such a big risk of 
you know, waves where everything becomes much more progressive and then it just dips again. And I've had w women come up to me and say, thank God, it feels like something's finally happening, but please be warned that in 1970, I thought we'd, we'd kind of conquered everything and then it all went down again. So, um, you know, I, th I think we are in this interesting transition phase and I hope it will lead to kind of continual uh, progress. But what I wanted to say is I think those all-female initiatives at the moment are actually really important alongside mm. campaigns that involve men and women. Um, and uh, I think relating to some of your points on gender pay gap, another area, as well as tech, for example, is looking at the number of investors who are investing in female startups. So only 15% of record labels are majority owned by women. And I'd love to see, and it's one of our recommendations in the manifesto, some uh, investment funds that are targeted at women only who are entrepreneurs who could actually start setting up their own companies across different sectors. Um, so that, again, it's not in that competitive environment where men tend to be bigger in numbers and end up getting, getting the investment. Can I just uh, still add, I, I forgot to say something. You asked, uh, you know, what might be the good things that have been done in Finland. I think the most important thing is always just to talk about the category of why are we talking about diversity in the first place. And um, I've actually been involved in Finland in establishing the uh, International Gender Equality Prize. This is the first international gender equality pr prize, basically promoting and, and really trying to work on, on advancing gender equality across the globe. And uh, it's been established because we want to just both within Finland and internationally, highlight the fact that what do we actually establish with diversity? And, uh, you know, our case, the case of what happened in Finland is such a brilliant one that all we need to do is just to explain that. And it's, it's a fact that, you know, uh, in the turn of the century, uh, um, 19, 1905, 1906, we were still one of the poorest countries in the world. Still in the 40s, we, we received um, martial aid, which is, you know, sort of uh, poor countries development aid. So we really were one of the poorest countries. But the one thing that was really, really revolutionary was the fact that Finland was the first country in the world in 1906 to give full political rights for women. This was, they took a huge risk. Nobody knew what this would mean. Nobody knew whether this would be uh, beneficial. Uh, I can tell you not everybody thought that it would be beneficial. But the, uh, but the revolutionary thing in this was the fact that that the, the idea, the thinking behind it was that if we have as diverse decision making as possible, that brings the des best discussion, that brings the de best sort of people in the leadership, and the best sort of more, more uh, like sort of debated viewpoints. And now, to, today, that's the most modern leadership thinking. If you go to any management go school that is good in the world, they will always talk about uh, diversity in the management and diversity in leadership and diversity in workforce. So that was the thinking. It was revolutionary. It was far behind, uh, before its time, uh, that thinking, that if we have diversity in decision-making in our country, that will build, bring the best thinking. And that's exactly what happened. You know, now take any index in the world, whether it's about wealth, health, happiness, you know, whatever, we're always on top. Like, for example, the second time in a row for happiness. Can you, can you actually desire for a more better index than happiness? I don't think so, and we're number one for second time in a row. And the only thing that is different with Finland and some other countries in the world is this particular thing.